there's a coffee and tea in the back room if people want to get something, if they're so inclined. Check, check. Hello. My name is Doug Salat. I am the lead for Barnes uh, Tech Lab here, and we do these uh, talks on mostly a monthly basis. So welcome to yet another uh, Tech Talk on Sunday. Uh, today's talk is going to be from uh, Bainbridge Prepares, and some of you may know of the organization on the island. They've done lots uh, in terms of the, uh, the COVID response and other emergency responses. They just formed a new organization, a sub-wing called Tech Ops, and within Tech Ops is a specialization uh, for drone operation. And uh, Rakesh uh, Barani? Barania, it's close, uh, is here to uh, give a talk on uh, those operations. So, Rakesh, take it away. Hey, everyone, I hope you can see now that these slides on the television. 
version here. So if you need to move over so you can see uh, what's going on, that's um, fantastic. But uh, thanks so much, and I appreciate Barn for having the space for us to come and talk to all of you about the drone program and what we're going to do. And hopefully I'll get to enlist some of you into our efforts here. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about what our program is about, what we're trying to do, why we're doing it now. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Bainbridge Prepares Tech Ops organization and all of the values and all the technologies that we're trying to bring together to help the island in times of emergency. I'll talk a little bit about why we're actually launching a drone program at all and why it's a volunteer-based drone program when so many drone programs in emergency response tend to be based in government, like the police department or the fire department. And I'll talk about how we need your help. We want to recruit at least some of you who might be interested into doing this work. And I would love to engage in a dialogue and a question and answer period. Uh, drones are a topic that can be controversial. Um, they have been in other communities. And so it's really important to have community buy-in to anything that we do here. And so what I want to also acknowledge is that uh, Pascal Schubach and Neil McConnell are, are both here in the room with us here. Uh, Pascal and Neil, can you just raise your hands real quick? Neil, Neil's sitting there. Um, they're also part of our drone team, um, and hopefully all of our questions, all of your questions, we can answer between the three of us, and if not, then we have other issues beyond that. A little bit about who I am. I'm the chief pilot for the air operations team for uh, Bainbridge Prepares. Uh, I have been a resident of Bainbridge Island since 2021, so I'm relatively new. Uh, just moved here, actually Pascal convinced my wife and I to move here uh, back during the pandemic. And my kids go to Blakely and soon to be Sakai. Uh, I have been doing technology and emergency response for almost 30 years. I don't want to think about that too much. Um, most recently on the Ukraine conflict. So I work in all sorts of different situations, whether it's natural disasters or conflicts or what have you. Uh, former EMS supervisor, and I currently work for USAID as the digital humanitarian advisor for that organization. So uh, thinking about how technologies show up in times of emergency or crisis for the federal government when it responds overseas. And then previously, I was the director of humanitarian technology for Salesforce. I worked uh, as a privacy engineer at Apple, and then I helped create Cisco's humanitarian response team uh, after September 11th uh, at Cisco Systems. So I have a pretty large background, both in Silicon Valley, but also in emergency response. And we have, uh, we're hoping to bring all of these experiences from our team, our volunteers, Pascal and myself, all into shaping how we do disaster technology here for Bainbridge Island. Because even though we have all these global experiences, we happen to live here on the, on the island and this is what we do, we live here. Before I get started, I'd like to just say thank you. Thank you for your time, thank you for your questions. I want to invite all the questions. And thank you for your participation. As I said, this is a community program. It is based in the community, by the community, and hopefully for the community. And so without your buy-in, without your participation, it doesn't really go anywhere. And that's the Walla Walla there, and this was taken from the drone sitting on the table. Uh, I'll call attention to the fact that we do have a drone static display. So if you want to take a look afterwards as to what these drones are, what they can do, ask us questions about their technology and their capabilities, uh, we've got two drones on the table there uh, for you to take a look at. Uh, we will not be flying them in the room as much as some of us might want to, but uh, <laughs> Pascal, he, he's like, oh man, I want to. Anyway, so the point is, is that we will certainly be able to ask, answer questions about the hardware and the equipment and the capabilities, okay? So what are we trying to talk about today? What are the key things? First of all, to, for you to understand that we are creating a volunteer-based program within Bainbridge Prepares. Most of you, as um, was mentioned in the introduction, interacted with Bainbridge Prepares probably during the COVID clinic, and maybe some of you have had some interactions with the organization in other areas. Maybe some of you have been volunteers. But it's important to know that we are creating a drone program. And that this drone program is a partnership of Bainbridge Prepares in addition to the City of Bainbridge Island Emergency Management, uh, the Emergency Manager, rather. We are communicating and collaborating in structuring this with the Bainbridge Island Fire Department, with the Bainbridge Police Department and the US Coast Guard. And we've actually had meetings with all three of these organizations over the last 90 days or so. 
initial operations are starting now. I don't know how many of you were actually at the Rotary auction a few weeks ago, but uh, we were flying drones for that event. That was our first initial event in the real world. What's really important to underscore here is that we want to be a good neighbor because we live here. We want to be a partner and we want to be an example of how to do this right. And just to give you a sense of some of the things that we can do or some of the things that drones can do, uh, the photos here, I know that the captions are too small to read, but the top photo is the corner of Eagle Harbor Drive and Wyatt Way uh, back uh, in April when there was a rollover vehicle accident. So for those of you who drive that part of the island, you know that there's a turn there and sometimes someone doesn't really quite make the turn. That's a vehicle that actually went off the side there, rolled over, and the patient had been extracted right where my pointer is right now. And then not too far away, back in December, uh, there was a black ice event on Buckland. And of course, as Buckland goes, lots of people lose it in the black ice, and there's like six cars in the ditch there. And ironically, I live right there at the end of Eagle Harbor Drive and Buckland, and so without actually leaving my property, I could launch a drone, and I got these pictures. So um, just to give you a sense of what was going on. And the drone that was used for this, is this is actually a drone that Pascal owns, and it's about the size of your, the palm of your hand. I mean, you can get a lot of really good da data now from a drone that's actually quite small. So who we are. Um, Bainbridge prepares technical operations. We're sort of the geeky, nerdy side of emergency response. So if you think about all the technologies that might go into a modern community resiliency program, but take out the radios, that's who we are. So the things that are really important is that everything that we do is kind of part of an integrated architecture. So the drones are actually part of a broader vision that we're bringing to the island that includes things like Wi-Fi and cybersecurity and a bunch of other technologies. There are four core values that are important to us. So everything that we do as a technology operations team uh, are underpinned by these four values, which is A, putting users first, because when you're stressed and on your worst day because a disaster has just happened, making sure things are easy and actually flexible is really important. We talk a lot about security and privacy a lot. In the cars with drones, the privacy conversation is very top of mind. We talk about equity and justice because it turns out that not everyone has equal access to technology, not everyone has equal experiences with technology. And so whatever happens, you know, wh whatever you come to the table with with regards to technology, when the disaster happens, that's how you experience it. And so we want to make sure that we're leaving nobody in the community behind. And then the last thing is sustainability. And sustainability is one of two things. It's actually both. One is ecological sustainability, because guess what? We might lose the power grid during a major emergency here. So can we design technologies that are ready to be used with things like solar and wind power? But then the other thing is that we're a 501c3 nonprofit. And so we live on the donated dollar. And so we have to be good stewards of the donated dollar. And so the whole point here is that our, our sort of North Star is this idea of what we call the effective, efficient, and equitable use of technology during emergencies, or what we call the three E's of impact. And for those of you who are more interested in diving into our program, the URL down there, bainbridgeprepares.org slash techops, that has all the details you want to know about how we structure and how we think about things. For right now, just know that these values go into our drone program. And what we do. This is an example of some of the stuff that we've done and are doing. Um, we have set up satellite emergency networks using SpaceX Starlink. So this is the new uh, satellite internet connectivity uh, program from SpaceX. We do the emergency Wi-Fi network. So if any of you were at Rotary and got on the Wi-Fi there, that was us. Um, we also support things like video and voice over IP. So we assume that in a disaster, that the normal telecommunications infrastructure might go out, but people still need to make phone calls, or people might still need to see what's going on. Cybersecurity and privacy, again, underpins everything. We try to think about why we're collecting data, what the intention is behind it, how we can minimize that, and how we can secure that. Uh, we know that digital infrastructure can and will be attacked, and so our start point is how do we stay resilient in the face of all of those things. And then one of the other things that we're working on is off-grid power solutions. The idea that what happens when we lose the grid? Do we have a generator? Do we need solar power systems? How can we design our technology solutions to be as 
frugal as possible with a power budget so that we can run those things for the longest time possible. And just to give you a sense of some of our impact, uh, we've done, all, so all the laptops, Wi-Fi software, and cybersecurity for the Bainbridge Island COVID community clinics over the last couple of years, that was us, and we got more than 36,000 people vaccinated, uh, both island residents as, all, as well as people in the broader Kitsap community. We supported Bainbridge Island's uh, Cascadia Rising exercise with just solar power and satellite internet. So there's actually a photo down there in the lower uh, right-hand corner of at the exercise where we just set up a couple of solar panels and SpaceX. And then we had like 60 or 80 volunteers and emergency responders using the internet uh, completely off grid. And then of course, the, the most recent thing you probably know us for is the rotary auction where we supported 3,402 devices. So again, people who got onto the Wi-Fi at rotary, that was us, if you were able to make a uh, call, text, do a FaceTime, what have you, that, that was a capability we brought. And that was compared to Rotary Auction 2022 when the cell phone networks were crushed and no one could communicate, where the Rotary Auction became a black hole. So, and for us, I think the way that we would think about it is that was sort of a planned disaster. We get to break out all of our toys and tools and make sure that everything works in a non-crisis. Although if you were really trying to get that kayak, that might've felt a little bit like a crisis to you. But this is just to give you a flavor of the work that we do. And then of course, uh, the photo of the drones here, that was actually uh, drone, that was actually at the rotary auction at the landing zone that, that Neil was flying at. Uh, and we had a couple of drones there as well. But of course, we're talking about drones today. So the first obvious question is, why are we doing a volunteer program on Bainbridge Island? The reality is that we are a relatively small community. The, Island is roughly the size of Manhattan Island, but we got about 26,000 people on it who live here, plus or minus the people who are commuting or the tourists that happen to be here on any given day. So our firefighters, we have nine firefighters on duty at any given time. We have a handful of police officers at any given time. And so if there were to be a major emergency, you kind of need your cops and firefighters to stay cops and firefighters. There are no helicopter assets typically available to our responders. So if we actually had a fire that was going into the woods, for example, the nearest firefighting helicopter that would be available for, um, for us is from Olympia. And it actually is on the Canadian border today. Uh, if there was a boat that got into trouble offshore and the Coast Guard needed to launch a helicopter to come rescue somebody that was in the water, that helicopter has to come from Port Angeles. If there was an oil spill in Eagle Harbor, the nearest drone team for pollution response is the US Coast Guard in Seattle. And they would actually have to go to Seattle, grab the drones out of the office in Seattle, and then bring them back here. And by that time, the, the oil spill is two, three miles away. Many of our responders live off island, right? So if there were to be a major emergency like uh, an earthquake, or even a situation like we had construction that blocked the Agate Pass Bridge for a while, and people suddenly needed to be here in order to pr do a flight mission, they would have to come from off island somehow. That may or may not be viable in a given circumstance. And so our thinking is, can we have some of these kind of specialty technical capabilities based in the community where people actually live and work here? And so the use cases that we're looking at involve things like firefighting, search and rescue, supporting mapping and damage assessments, either pre or post event, and pollution spill response. Now, one key thing that I will emphasize here right now is that law enforcement specific use cases are excluded from the program. Uh, Bainbridge Police Department has not asked us to do this. They don't want us doing it. Um, and that's fine with us because that involves a whole bunch more evidence handling and a bunch of other stuff that we don't want to get into. Uh, so the law enforcement specific stuff is excluded, but since Bainbridge Police Department does run their boat to fire and rescues offshore, we need to interoperate with them. All right, so go ahead. They don't want us doing law enforcement specific stuff. Right, because it requires things like a chain of evidence and a bunch of other stuff that we're not set up to do. Um, so, you know, Chief Clark, you know, 
Pascal and I met with Chief Clark just recently and we wanted to make sure that we were scoping what we should be doing and more importantly, what we should not be doing. That's correct, that's correct. Yeah, so BIPD, fire, every, everybody's really enthusiastic about this in fact. Yeah, no worries and, and if anyone else has any other questions or comments, feel free to chime in at any time too. So we said, why a volunteer program? The next obvious question is, is why now? And the Walla Walla is the answer. So obviously, we all know that back in April, Walla Walla ground itself on the southern end of the island here with 700 passengers and crew. This was considered a level one mass casualty activation for Kitsap County. Uh, for those of you who were on the island that day, you may remember that there were sirens screaming north to south all afternoon. It was kind of a big deal, and a lot of resources came here to the island. Now, it turns out that we had two drones on the beach. Pascal and I were sitting there in Pascal's truck with a couple of drones, but because the Coast Guard had their helicopter overhead, we didn't launch. Because rule number one of emergency response is you don't become part of the problem. But there was an extended period of time when there was no helicopter overhead, because the, the ship was on the ground there, was on ground for about 12 or 14 hours before high tide came in and they were able to refloat her. And so one of the questions that came out is, you know, could we have flown and shared live video or other situational awareness with the incident commander on scene, the people who were actually leading the response on scene? Could we have shared something to the Kitsap City Emergency Operations Center, which is currently in City Hall, but will soon be at the new police building? Could we have shared something to Kitsap County o over on the other side of the water here? Could we have shared something to the US Coast Guard itself in Seattle, right? Could we have helped put eyes on the situation in a way that made everyone else's response better? And in fact, uh, one thing that the Bainbridge Island Fire Department said was that there was a significant concern that people would try and essentially jump off the boat and try and wade or swim to shore. And there were often times where there, was there were no eyes on the far side of the ship. And so even if we're just standing there with a controller with a drone overhead, we can say there's no one in the water or if someone were to jump in the water, we could put eyes on that person uh, and help support things like scene safety that way. And so the fact that we don't have helicopters just sitting around on Bainbridge Island, and yet sometimes getting that aerial perspective would be really, really helpful. Key elements of our program, safety, equity, and community are absolutely cornerstones about this. We all know, and probably a number of you know stories about drones that are seen as really annoying, actually. They're buzzy, they're loud, they're privacy invasive, you can choose your thing. We start off knowing this, right? We recognize this as a fact that when you do drones poorly, they're seen as a bother or worse. And so a couple of things that we are doing is first and foremost, we are building a safety culture within the drone program based on what's called crew resource management principles. This is stuff that comes from the world of aviation like real airplanes and real helicopters. And so this notion of CRM is really important to making sure that we, ha we fly safe and we fly with full awareness of what we are doing and why we are doing it. The next thing is that in our flight operations manual, literally the second section in the manual on page two, talks about protection of civil rights and privacy. And this is really important because all of our flight crews, whether you're an observer or whether you're a pilot, the expectation is that we have a responsibility to ensure the protection of civil rights and the public's reasonable expectations of privacy, right? If, if someone sees a drone hovering outside their window, that's gonna feel very invasive, right? That's really kind of bad. So what we wanna do is we say that at all times, crews are prohibited from drone use that is or could be seen as intrusive, harassing, demeaning, or subjecting someone to public curiosity even if that is otherwise legally allowed. And this is important because if you wanna talk about policies, the, the rules for drones are set by the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA. But what the FAA allows drone pilots to do and what the public might find acceptable may vary from community to community. 
and what people will tolerate as members of the public will vary from community to community. And so what we want to do is make sure that we are setting very conservative buffers so that the Bainbridge Island public, AKA all of you, don't feel that this is a bother, right? And so for things like, you know, we, we prohibit, we're prohibiting ourselves from doing law enforcement missions. We are prohibiting ourselves from broad surveillance activities like just flying around looking for trouble. You know, kind of things like that that you see in other communities, to be honest. Uh, what we say is that use is limited to contextually legitimate and specific mission needs. So there has to be a specific reason why we're flying. And it has to be purpose limited. And so public engagement, uh, aside from having this conversation with all of you today, uh, we are in dialogue with Bainbridge Island, the Race Equity Advisory Committee, REAC, uh, because how communities of color have experienced drones around the country have been a little bit different. And we want to make sure that we engage in those dialogues and build that trust. Uh, we will be showing things like a date preparedness or wherever Bainbridge Prepares has a table, you know, just engaging with the public. We're talking about having our drones there and our volunteers or myself or Pascal or Neil or somebody there to just answer questions. And then public consultations, feedback, always welcome. We actually welcome feedback. And so if any of you saw the signage at Rotary that says, hey, we're flying drones today, you will have noticed that there, our email address for our team is there because if people have questions or concerns about this stuff, we want to be accessible. One other thing that we're doing very much so is we are we explicitly welcoming women and BIPOC UAS crews. Um, having a diverse crew of pilots and observers is one way of mitigating things like insular thinking, enhancing our innovation, and still getting community buy-in. Um, you know, our, our personal belief is that any program that serves the community should reflect the diversity of the community that it serves. And so, now admittedly, this is going to be a challenge because it turns out that 93% of the licensed drone pilots in the United States are men. And so, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not naive about this. We do have our work cut out for us, but we want to make sure that we are a welcoming environment to anyone who wants to serve. And we welcome service from anybody and everybody. So where are we in our journey? Um, I call this the riot model of development. Uh, research, integrate, operate, train, and teach. Um, we're kind of in the, somewhere between research and integration. We spent the last few months kind of talking to the responders, figuring out what's needed, um, you know, talking to some volunteers, getting some initial volunteers, and seeing what drones they had and how we might use it and what sort of products we might put, put out there. And now we're starting to operate that very early operations. We haven't flown any emergency response missions yet, but we have flown real missions in support of things like the Rotary Auction, which is like a public service event. But this is sort of the journey in the timeline. So we're kind of in the summer of 2023 space, and then we expect that this maturity is starting to build over the fall and into the winter time. And this is frankly why I'm here. First of all, it's to engage in public dialogue because as the public, you guys need to have a buy-in to this. And secondly, hopefully some of you want to volunteer and join us and help us with this. So anybody can go buy a drone. You can go to Amazon today and go buy a drone if you want. But there's a difference between a toy and a tool that is suitable for emergency response, right? Um, if you wanted to fly a drone in your backyard, there's no reason why you can't. Go, go to Amazon, it'll show up here tomorrow, and away you go, right? Within a certain limit. There's rules around that sort of thing. But in order to maintain trust and build a sustainable capability, we have to look around and say, well, are there standards? What sort of things should we be doing? So this means that our air operations team must understand not just how to fly a drone, but actually how to do emergency response with drones. And so FEMA is coming out with a standard this summer that they've already published that says, here's what emergency response drones should be able to do. This is what the staff of an emergency response drone team should be able to do. This is the training they need to have. And we are aligning to that. And as far as I know, we are the first ones in the entire Puget Sound region to actually explicitly align to the emerging FEMA standards, even though we are a volunteer program and not part of a fire department or police department. One of the nice things about being brand new is that we get to start with the latest thinking. So we're starting with the FEMA standards. 
So there are minimum standards for the crews, both pilots and observers, and there are minimum standards for drones and support equipment. And so, ex for example, in, in, FEMA, in FEMA speak, there's this notion of what's called type rating. So if I call up a fire department and I say, I need a type one fire engine, that means something. It means it has a certain capability, it has a certain tank, it can pump so many uh, gallons of water per minute. Um, a Type 4 helicopter, same thing. I, if I'm calling up a helicopter, I know what kind of resource it is. Even if I don't know the specific model or which agency it's coming from, there's this notion of type rating. And so FEMA has determined that there are two type ratings for drones, and in fact, our ta on the table over there, we have a Type 2 drone on the right and a Type 1 drone on the left. And so we're already aligning our capabilities to the standards where they make sense for us. So what, is, what do the missions kind of look like? Um, so on the left-hand side, you see one from a recent exercise. Uh, Bainbridge Repairs has a flotilla organization that has a bunch of boats. So the idea is that when there's a disaster and normal, um, maybe the ferry service is disrupted or, or we need to repatriate people from Seattle back to Bainbridge Island, uh, these volunteer boat owners will do it. And so Neil just flew a mission uh, a few days ago where he provided drone support for the flotilla exercise. And so they, we got some nice pictures of the boats right by the Space Needle and everything. The Rotary Auction flying maps. So if any of you saw on the Rotary Facebook page, they had some overhead imagery of the auction as people were dropping off. Um, that, was, that was us. That was Neil specifically. <laughs> and then more recently, things like other emergency responses, things like fire response, or pollution hazmat. In fact, uh, on the right-hand side, that second topmost photo was just from this weekend. I was actually in Ocean Shores, Washington, right on the coastline, and we came across a pollution spill, a bunch of what's called bunker fuel washed up on the beach. And so I actually had my drone, because I was just flying it around for as a hobby, um, just doing it as a, you know, just doing photography. But I actually took photos and video of the, the oil spill, and I sent that over to the Washington State Department of Ecology and the Coast Guard so that they could figure out what, what to do about it. And then things like search and rescue. The, the, the lower photo? The lower photo is actually a thermal photo. So that's an example of, um, it's actually that drone there on the left, it actually has a thermal camera on it. So if we had to go missing, uh, looking for a missing person, for example, or mapping a fire, we could do that with the thermal capability on the drone. Um, in this case, that's actually me. The person that's standing there highlighted in the thermal image, that's actually me uh, taking a picture of myself. But just to give you a sense of what we could do with it from a search and rescue standpoint, if you, you know, we occasionally have hikers that are missing on the island. We also have occasionally people who fall into the water off of the ferry and are in the water. And sometimes being able to fly a drone over the water and seeing a hot spot in the water that might indicate that the person's just kind of floating there would be useful. So what are our next steps? Well, right now we're talking to, our, to the agency. So this is things like what we call mission stakeholder engagement. Uh, we are in active dialogue with the fire department, with the police department, with the city of Bainbridge Island's emergency management uh, leaders. And we have already met with the Coast Guard. And the Coast Guard and others, we are working on building the activation processes and protocols. Like what does it actually look like to get a call? When do you get called out? What do you respond with? There's a lot of sort of logistical stuff that we have to work through that we're actively working through right now. And in fact, um, the Coast Guard has already offered their boats, their drone team, and even their helicopters to train with us. And I'm like, wow, that's really cool, guys, but we're not ready to train with your helicopters yet because obviously that's some of the highest risk flying we might do, right? Because having drones and a crewed aircraft in the same airspace, that's kind of a big responsibility. And so we want to make sure that we have all of our ducks in a row before we do something like that. But they were offering that to us right straight up. And the Bainbridge Island Fire Department wants to do some training exercises with us in the next few weeks so that we can actually exercise not just flying the drones, but really what the process is around all of these things. Like what, is it, you know, what does it take? What do you show up with? Things along those lines. We're going to be building the activation processes, communications like should you know how to use a radio and what sort of training do you need for that? And then of course, engaging with the community. So these are two different things, right? Engaging with the authorities is one thing, but the other thing is engaging with all of you as the public. 
you know. So the Race Equity Advisory Committee, I actually, I actually have two members of REAC who want to come to my house and fly drones with me so they can actually see what they do and, you know, basically take the mystery out of the thing. Um, we are talking here today, and we're talking about day of preparedness and other events. And if any of you have any other ideas of community groups or organizations or individuals we should be reaching out to, um, I certainly want to hear about that. We want to capture that stuff so that we do engage that. Again, this is a community-based program, and so it's really important that we do have that community buy-in and trust. And then ultimately what we need to do is just practice and update and revise what we're doing. So the last slide, honestly, before we can talk, throw it open for you guys, we need you. We need you both as members of the public to ask us questions and make sure that we're staying on the right track. But m perhaps more importantly for this talk, I would love if some of you would love to get involved here. So first and foremost, what do you need to do? So everybody who is part of our program is a member of Bainbridge Prepares. So you have to sign up with Bainbridge Prepares, and that involves, there's a sign-up form, you have to get a credential from the city of Bainbridge Island and things along those lines, right? So you have to be a member of Bainbridge Prepares. And then you're a part of tech ops, right? And people can be part of multiple teams and everything like that. In order to be a pilot, you do need to have an FAA Part 107 license. So there, if you're flying a drone recreationally and it's a small drone, people don't need a license for those things. But if you're flying for anything other than recreation or you're flying a larger drone up to 55 pounds, you need to actually ha pass a flight exam, or uh, uh, FAA exam, rather. And that pilot's license is about $175 to take it. It's a written exam. You take it in Bremerton. You'll need to have a drone, and you'll need to have, like, perform a basic flight exam with the drone. Basically, come to my house, fly the drone, show me you know, how to use the drone and, and fly it with a basic level of competency. Right, but you won't hit anybody with it. So this means that if you have a Part 107 license, you can sign up for our team relatively quickly. But of course, if you're a drone pilot or you're an enthusiast or if you're just curious or you want to get into drones, we could use you too. We need you to be what's called a visual observer. So when we fly drone missions, typically you want to have at least two people flying the mission. There's one person who actually has their hands on the controls and there's another person who's there to help out with systems, with communications, with maintaining awareness that the drone doesn't fly into a tree or something, right? So this is a way for people who may not have a drone license but who want to still support the community, who still want to support the program, this is a way for you to get involved. And we welcome people to be pilots, we welcome people to be observers, we welcome people to be both. So we... Yeah, so there are, so there are, so, so that's a really cool point. Um, there are different kinds of drones. Uh, the kind of drones where you're actually wearing the goggles and flying what's called first person, we don't actually have any of those in our inventory at this time. Um, we might do that later depending on what the mission needs are. The kind that we fly now, you're usually looking at an iPad or your cell phone or um, one of the controllers like what uh, we have over there on the display where you have, it's kind of an integrated all-in-one controller. But, so we do want to have at least two people flying these missions. Now, because we are an emergency drone program, FEMA says you need to actually understand how to speak emergency management a little bit. And so there are a handful of uh, online classes that take about four to five hours. They're free. You basically sit there online, you listen to the lecture, you take a couple of online quizzes, and then you get your FEMA certifications. So they want you to have the FEMA training, and then if you have experience with using radios, whether you're a ham radio operator, maybe you've used radio in a job or something like that before, if you're competent with a radio, great. If you have never used a radio before, Bainbridge Prepares has a radio class, right? So that way you know how to push the button and talk and you know can, can understand how to use a radio. And so that's, we, yes, go ahead. It's, it's zero dollars, the FEMA training's free. Um, so there are four classes in that FEMA wants you to have, and you, if, you, if you just sit there and kind of bang it out, you can probably complete it in about four hours. So you can do it in an afternoon if you wanted to. It's all, it's all online. Um, so the FAA wants you to be legal in order to fly. FEMA wants you to know emergencies in order to do emergency stuff with drones. Uh, 
No, so the FAA is actually an exam. You actually, the nearest test center is actually at the Bremerton Airport. So there are online schools. So if you don't have your Part 107 license, you can pick up a book and just go through a book. Um, I did an online course. It took me about $100, $150 to just sit there. And, and, and basically, it's a bunch of lectures with some online quizzes and stuff. And there's a bunch of places online that'll teach you. If you just say uh, online Part 107 school, there's a bunch of places that'll do that. Um, and so I basically, and I, I, I knocked it out. So I had never flown a drone before until last fall. And I took my, I took an online course. I took, I took about two months to do it and did it once every couple of days, you know, kind of not in a hurry. And then I just scheduled my test and I got that knocked out. And then as far as flying goes, so once you have your license, your training for FEMA and your radio communication stuff, then all we ask is that you fly with us once a year, whether it's an exercise or whether it's a real world thing, or both. I mean, to be honest, like once you get into drones, people tend to want to fly drones. So I don't think that'll be hard for anybody who actually gets into the program uh, to meet that basic competency requirement. Um, but it's a lot of fun. It's really useful. And the other thing that I'll say is that if you think about what climate change means to Bainbridge Island, when, it, when you think about the changing hazards of fire and things along those lines, this makes a lot of sense, right? This makes a lot of sense because we don't have helicopters now. And yet there are going to be circumstances where you need that aerial perspective. And so if we are neighbors helping neighbors, if we are neighbors helping our fire department and other first responders, that's probably the best way to do it at the level that we're at. And what I'll tell you though, is that when I talk to other communities around the Puget Sound region, a lot of the communities in the Western Puget Sound region, they don't have drone teams and they're looking to us to see how our model works. Because other places like Seattle or Tacoma, they're bigger, their, their departments could actually have drone programs, right? They have more staffing, they have bigger budgets. But for smaller communities that are gonna be left behind when the big emergency happens, how do they have their own capability that can give them the kind of awareness they need in order to make better decisions, you know? That's going to be community based. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, how many do you guys have? You have three. How many do you have, Neil? Yeah, so, I mean, and you're basically talking to the entire fleet right now. Yeah, so, so, so these are all personal drones right now. So, so when you, um, our program right now is that people show up with their drones and their pilot's license. So it's whatever personal drone you have. Um, if you need recommendations on what drones will be useful, we can make those recommendations because the FEMA rating, you know, we can say, hey, here are the drones that meet the FEMA requirements, for example. Um, we are looking to get team drones in the future. So for example, these kind of more larger drones that are more expensive, they might cost you know ten thousand, fifteen thousand um, dollars, or the ones that cost that have the thermal capabilities might cost seven thousand dollars. That may not be practical for volunteers to just show up with, and so we recognize that there may be some hybrid where you might have one or two team drones for those specialty things, and then the majority of our fleet are personal drones. It's, so this is the thing. So when you are flying under Bainbridge Prepares, we have a state mission number and we are covered under uh, the insurance of Bainbridge Prepares. Yeah, go ahead. When you drone, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that, so that's important to, I mean, that's obviously important to understand as well, right? You're, you're flying essentially the drone, your, your hardware is your own risk, right? If you have your drone insurance, it's maybe a good idea to have drone insurance. But, um, and, and that's also the distinction. This is something that other departments don't have. So, for example, Pulse Bowl Police Department has a drone program. But their drones are owned by the police department, right? Whereas, as a volunteer program, 
I might fly for Bainbridge Prepares, but then three hours later, I'm flying for my own recreation. Right, so it's important to clarify when you're flying for the program and, and under the circumstances of the program, as opposed to you just going out to fly in the park on a Sunday. Yeah, the, the privacy concerns are absolutely paramount about this, about what is personal data, when do we collect that. I mean, if you think about it, as an emergency drone program, you might be flying over someone's house who's just burning, or an accident, or something like that. Just because it's your drone does not mean it's your TikTok video, right? That data, if you're flying under the auspices of Bainbridge Preparers for an emergency response purpose, that is the emergency response agency's data, it's not yours. We are just sort of the conduit or the capture of the data in that moment. And so there's a whole section in the flight manual, which I kind of alluded to, but I didn't dive into it, around the cybersecurity and data handling and privacy aspects of all of this stuff. Yeah, there is no self-activation. So there's, um, there, there's a whole process that we're working with the COBE Emergency Management Agency, and this is, Pascal mentioned getting a state activation number and things like that. There is actually a flow for this. Uh, the U.S. Coast Guard has also given us an activation flow for coordinating for overwater stuff. For example, we have a, there's a 24-7 operations number for Seattle sector, and basically they said, if you're getting activated for something, call us. Here's the information you need to give us. This is the information we will give you. For example, hey, expect a helicopter to the same emergency, right? And here's the frequency they're gonna be talking to you on. Um, so the, the easiest way to blow trust with the community, whether it's with the response community or with the public, is to be a bunch of yahoos with drones. You can't let the adrenaline of the moment overcome good judgment and the process and the protocols that we're trying to put in place. And that's why having those things documented and trained and exercised are gonna be so important. I hope so. <laughs> I, the, the question is, is there gonna be grant money? Um, we are looking into that right now. Uh, that is a thing that is out there. There are grants for typically agencies to get these things. Um, what is a little trickier is for nonprofits to get them because we are a nonprofit. And so we're working with that, but we are in active dialogue. What I would say is that the partner agencies that we've talked to are super enthusiastic about supporting us. And so if we needed to get a letter on letterhead from these agencies saying, you should give these guys money so they can go get the stuff they need, um, I think there you would find that there's a lot of enthusiasm for building what we want. Yeah, well, so so I think um, actually that's a great question. The so basically the drones that are it's the way the FEMA system works is that the lower the number, the more capable the asset is. Uh, so it's like a golf score, lower is supposedly better, whatever that means. But in this case, so a Type Two drone basically is able to capture video and still photos, and it can fly for a certain amount of time. I think it's 30 minutes or something like this. So it's, a, it's, a, it's relatively straightforward. Basically, your standard DJI Mini 3 will meet that requirement. In fact, that's a Mini 3 Pro that's over there, and it very easily meets the requirements of people. Have. They're not very sophisticated requirements. Um, a Type 1 drone basically can capture still video and audio 
no, sorry, audio, still video and, sorry, still photos and video, but it also has specialty sensors. So in this case, um, the Type 1 drone, the larger drone on the left there, it has the ability to have, a, it has a thermal camera, but it also has a speaker, so we can actually use it as a loudspeaker, and it also has a searchlight, so we can actually illuminate, it's got like a 2500 lumen searchlight on it. And so if we need to look for something in the dark, we can look for something in the dark, we can provide lighting to people on the ground, or if we need to um, go to the Grand Forest and say, all you hikers get out of there, there's a, there's a fire in the Grand Forest, go to your west. Um, we, can, we can use that for basic communications and there's a sort of a loudspeaker. And it's quite loud, by the way. It's, it's, uh, I, I'm surprised by how loud that tiny thing is. Um, so we can use it for like public announcements. Or so for example, if we had a, a parade and a kid went missing at the parade, we could actually tell the public, hey, look for a five-year-old boy who's wearing a blue shirt and black jeans or whatever. Call 911 if you see the kid. Yeah, so these drones, um, each drone has its own environmental capabilities, and that's one of the things that as a drone pilot you need to know, right? So uh, some drones can fly in weather. Typically, they're the more expensive drones. Some drones cannot uh, fly in weather, or at least the manufacturer says they can't. Sometimes you fly them anyway. Um, at least that's just me. But each one has a certain amount of wind resistance, for example. So if the uh, wind starts to pick up, you'll start getting alerts saying, hey, you should descend to a lower altitude or you should think about coming home. Um, and this is the idea that the, the drone wants to be able to hold itself in a hover. So if the wind starts to pick up to a point where it can't hold itself in a hover, uh, for example, it'll start giving you error messages. So, but knowing your equipment is, is a really important thing in any sort of emergency response capability, not just drones, right? Even if you're doing search and rescue and you're using ropes and uh, other such things, you need to know what your, the load that your equipment can carry, right? Same thing. Yes. So the, most of the drones that you find are DJI or Autel. Um, between those two companies, they have about 70% of the drone market in the United States. Um, there are a number of other drone companies uh, around, but they all have smaller, like Parrot. And in fact, we've actually had conversations. There's a drone startup in Seattle called Brink Drones that makes specifically public safety drones. And we've actually had conversations with them about beta testing a couple of their unreleased products that they haven't announced yet. Um, but again, for consumers, I mean, typically we're talking about consumer drones at this point. So these are DJIs for the most part. Um, I think everybody that on our team has a DJI drone right now. Yes. Yeah. So, so you, that's correct. So all of our all, all of our flights are within what are called the, the the rules for Part 107, which means no more than 400 feet above the ground, and you have to keep the drone within line of sight the whole time. Um, so that's those are the standard things. Uh, there is work on creating what's called beyond visual line of sight, where you can actually have a drone launch and then go out of your visual field of view. Uh, we're keeping an eye on those rules as they emerge, but Right now, if you think about crawl, walk, run, we're kind of definitely at the crawl stage. And we will need to have a certain level of maturity before we get to those levels. Now, in the future though, you can see where that might be a really useful capability for. So if we have a report of a vegetation fire on the island, we might be able to launch a drone from say station 21 here and then have it fly and start orbiting the reported fire so that the video is getting down like straight into the fire engines even before they get there. Um, Technically, that's technology to do that exists today. It's really about regulatory, and then I think especially for Bainbridge Island, trust. Before we start doing something like that, the city, the public needs to know that we're doing it right. And so that means we need to have a, we need to have a, a track record of impact before we unlock those capabilities.
rally up together, share the flight patterns, and then be able to go fly different things and go, hey, the bridge looks somewhat compatible. Here's the data we can send it off from the Starlink to the state. Their engineers might be able to visually inspect it faster. We can go inspect all the KUPD water pumps and well houses. We can inspect you know, critical infrastructure areas that are needed much faster and be able to then go, this is our status and that capability. And those sometimes might need that beyond visual line of sight to get to it, to be able to be done faster. But it's also a way for us to test and fly certain streets as training to keep our hand skills up and available. Because there's not really that many things that do happen, but it's avail availability for us to be able to be ready for when it does happen. Give me a mic now, I won't talk to you. Uh, <laughs> is, there, um, is there anything else? Otherwise, um, I, I think that, let, let, let's do one. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, drone delivery systems. Yeah, it's, actually, it's funny, so my, um, my drone actually has a drop kit, um, and I think, Pascal, you have a, I, I think we have a couple of drop kits. We're just doing experiments with them, like being able to drop like a bottle of water, or a bottle of medicine, things like that. Um, I've actually done this in my in my my front yard is a big piece of lawn and I have a boat sitting in my yard that we actually got from Rotary a couple years ago, and I've actually delivered medicine to the boat uh, using it and um, so so we're 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 we're, we're testing that stuff we're, we're not talking about it in the concept of the program at this point because it's still too rudimentary and it's still not you know like right now we're not anywhere near that level of maturity where we're going to do that. Um, but you can imagine in the future, like having a situation where people in, in, in an emergency, people might need insulin. And can we partner with the community pharmacy to airlift uh, insulin from one side of the bridge that's not there anymore to the other side of the bridge that's not there anymore so that people on the island who are insulin dependent can actually get an insulin refill? You know, you can imagine scenarios like that. One other area to know, too, is if you are in Seattle, Magnolia, Ballard area, Pagliacci's Pizza has received permission to do delivery of pizza by drone. And it's supposed to be live right now. They can do two 13-inch pizzas in a drone drop delivery. And hopefully not dropping it, but actually like landing, <laughs> letting it go, and taking off. But that, that technology's out there. In many countries in Africa and South America, there's a drone company called Zipline. They've been delivering medicine under the innovation labs and being able to deliver up to 30 kilometers with blood pickups, uh, medicine drop-offs at clinics, launching out and then having the team, whoever's on the ground at the facility, throw the drone back up in the air and it takes off and brings the blood back or whatever it is. And so that technology is coming and we will probably start seeing it here in the Northwest fairly quickly with the tech and the companies that we have here innovating. But I'm waiting for my pizza. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think again, from a local perspective, it'll ultimately come down to trust, right? We, we, we have to be able to fly this for a while, demonstrate and be accountable and transparent to the public so that when they see an, a drone flying around, it's not a cause of alarm or annoyance, right? We, we, gotta, we gotta demonstrate that, and that's really a burden for us to meet. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we're being responsible uh, neighbors with this stuff. Yeah. Cowboy drones, is there anything they can do? Yeah, that's a really great uh, question. And I think that's actually a broader question for society, not just Bainbridge Island, but across the country and ultimately for m many developed societies. So the question is, what makes the difference between a cowboy with a drone and someone who's trying to be a little bit more professional about it? We've already seen incidents where people see something dramatic happening on the ground or on the skies and they just launch a drone out there so they can get that TikTok video or that YouTube video, and they create problems. So we just had an incident in Snohomish County uh, a, about a month ago, actually, where they had, they had a, a brush fire, and somebody decided to just fly a drone around the fire, and so all the helicopters and aircraft fighting the fire actually had to go, go away. That's grounding it, right? And so that is a challenge. We've seen that happen. In fact, there was, a, there was another man in Southern California who has just pled guilty 
to flying his drone near aircraft, not once, but three times, including a Coast Guard helicopter, uh, causing those aircraft to have to take evasive maneuvers. Um, that's the stuff that's gonna give drones a really bad name, right? It only takes a few of those kind of incidents to put the whole technology uh, in a bad light. So starting in September, drones will have to have a transponder on them. It's called remote ID. This is required uh, across the country. So drones will need to broad, it's basically like having a license plate. Um, if, if you're familiar with airplanes or helicopters, they all have to have a registration number on the side of them. And so the idea is that the drone and the drone pilot are identifiable and accountable for what they're doing. Um, so that takes, th that law comes into effect in September. And so that will be something that all of our drones have to comply with. Um, but, but this is also why flying coordinated is really important. Um, I go back to the Walla Walla incident. One of the things that was really, you know, I've, we've talked to the Bainbridge Island emergency responders about this. Walla Walla is sitting there on the beach. I don't know if any of you saw her sitting there on the beach that, that evening. You know, the mountain was out. It's really scenic. It was a scenic disaster, if you think of it that way. And you could just see someone with a drone saying, oh my gosh, I just want to get a video or a photo of this. Right, like you can just see someone who just, they're, they're overcome by their desire to use the technology over their judgment, and they might launch it. But there's a helicopter circling overhead, and when you're a helicopter, and you're only 100 feet off the ground, and you're low and slow, and you're looking down at the boat, and you're trying to figure out a mission, drones are sometimes really hard to see. And so making sure that we're doing that um, responsibly and in a coordinated manner is really important. Um, the lead of the Coast Guard drone program in Seattle, she also happens to be an HH-65 helicopter pilot, so she actually has one foot in both worlds, and she could actually authoritatively say, this is what I as a helicopter pilot would be seeing, would be looking for, this is what I need from you as a drone team, you know, to de-conflict that stuff. Um, another area that will be more and more important, I think, over time is this notion of drone detection which is can we actually tell whether there's a drone in the area or not? There's some technology around this, but it's really, really expensive stuff. Um, eventually that, that will get cheaper. And I think the biggest area that we, we need to think about that as a community is really around Station 21 where Airlift Northwest comes into. Because as people get drones, you'll want the air ambulance crew to be able to say, yes, the pad is green or the pad is red, uh, whether there's someone there or not, right? So, but again, that's sort of a, that's beyond the scope of our, our program right now, but it is something that we know is out there that will have to be tackled at some point or another because this technology is here. It's not going away, and it's going to become more and more prolific over time. And so we want to make sure that we're keeping, we're keeping people safe. Yes? Where would money for a grant go? Um, that's Depends on where it comes from. Yeah, I, I, I think pa Pascal, you've done Pascal's yeah, done a lot of I, grant work. I so. deal with grants every day with FEMA and the feds. Um, so it depends on how the grant works and who you apply for. So like there's fire, there's state fire grants, there's federal fire grants, there's state emergency management grants, there's federal emergency management grants, there's private sector public funding, there's nonprofit funding grants from all the feds. And so what's nice about Bainbridge Repairs, the city and the fire department is they work together. So if the fire department gets the grant funds, it's the fire department's asset, but they would assign it to the structure that we have. If it's the city getting it through the city funds, as an example, the equipment that we got for the wireless network and the emergency kits, majority of that was funded by federal funds assigned to the state emergency management grant, and it was leftover money that we were able to quickly apply for. It was just under $20,000 and it was assigned, but it's assigned from the city to Bainbridge Repairs. So we manage it and support it for the city, but it's technically their property, and it has to be disposed of you know, correctly, all those things, but we account for it and manage that. If it's a private foundation, rotary, you know, the rotary funds, or a bigger foundation or a group, that could be depending on who applies for it, and they tend to prefer to donate directly to the nonprofit side, and that's where Bainbridge Repairs would come in but the asset would be used by anybody who needs it. So it's, it would be all used to the proper amount and proper location, but depending on the paper trail, it kind of goes however we can get the funds. Because you, you request more, and you only get maybe 10%. Does that answer your question? <coughs> How's the money get spent? 
So most of it would be spent, it, it might only be funding to support the auxiliary equipment necessary to operate. So extra batteries, the chargers and trucks, you know, making sure the battalion truck or whatever vehicles can help us charge, providing solar power equipment for us to charge. It may not include, depending on the grant, the actual aircraft. So some federal grants don't provide funding for aircraft type equipment, but they will do for all the auxiliary things. So a, a monitor, a tripod, a stand, whatever, whatever. Whereas some other grants will only apply for the aircraft and you gotta fund all the auxiliaries. Some grants are just training based. So as FEMA offers training, there's a, two new courses coming out. It's part of the FEMA education program. If you can apply for it, FEMA actually pays for your airfare, hotel, lodging to get to the training, but you gotta get into the training. That's where the agencies help with a letter showing that, hey, we are authorized to be doing this. Can we get in? But some of those trainings are not free, so some of the funds might only go for training. And so some agencies might go, here, here's grant funds to go training, but not for hardware or equipment. So it really varies on what is it you need. What we're trying to do right now is identify what is every individual pilot need. Safety equipment, radios, all that stuff and going, okay, how can we divide this up and what grant funds can we do to apply for? Some grant funds we apply for multiple things knowing that we're gonna get cut. So whatever we can get from either one, we will take, but if we get something from another grant, we won't spend it from the other one if we do get both. So we kind of balance it, but you have to kind of play, I don't wanna say playing the lottery, but you are reaching out and going, I'm gonna see whoever can give us some funds to help support what our objective is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sure, um, can I post a slide deck? And I'm gonna, I'm, I'll make sure the barn folks have the slide deck and uh, yeah. And again, the, the other thing I will say is go to the Bainbridge Prepares website, look at the Tech Ops team, um, our, our stuff is there. I'm going to be creating, we're going to be creating a, a web page just for the drone stuff because I imagine there's going to be frequently asked questions that will need to be answered, uh, contact us and specifically have questions around the drone program. So that's something that we're expecting to have soon. Um, I was thinking about having it two weeks ago, but we decided to go to Ocean Shores and have a vacation instead. So, it, it, but it's coming because we know that w there needs to be a certain transparency. One area that didn't come up but is going to be important is we're going to need to demonstrate to the public when we fly, how we fly, and what we did. Uh, there does need to be a, a public accountability of what we do as an organization around the drones. Um, again, as a trust measure. Um, and an accountability measure. So, so we're, we're in active discussions about what that might look like right now. Uh, yes? Next steps. Um, let me go back here. So, if you are not in Bainbridge Prepares, sign up to be part of Bainbridge Prepares. And then once you've got that process started, or if you're already in Bainbridge Prepares and you want to get started on this, you can contact us at airops at bainbridgeprepares.org and we can walk you through all of this stuff. So we'll have the slides up here, but this is basically the basic journey. It's get your part 107 license if you wanna be a pilot. Get an, if you, if you wanna be an observer, that's totally cool. There's no requirement for you to get a part 107 for that. But if you wanna actually fly a mission uh, and be the hands on the sticks, you do need to have your part 107. You need to get the FEMA training and we can give you links to all of this stuff. There's no links to it yet, but, but we'll get you all the links and we'll get you to the radio communications course. And if you already know radio communications, then you just show us that you know how to use a radio and we call it good. Um, that's a great question. Are we going to be doing, and, and then, I mean, we're gonna be doing exercises and flight training like that, but are you talking about more like a boot camp to go through the flight school and stuff like that? You know, that's a really interesting question because I've had two people ask me that question and that's not something that we've set up to do but it might be something that we might wind up doing anyway. So put a pin in that and come back to us on it. But for right now, we're saying you should come in with your 107 or, or be on your way to getting a 107 uh, if you're gonna be a pilot. But again, if you're a drone enthusiast and you like flying without a license or you um, are just interested in the topic and wanna help us, whether you don't want to, you know, not everyone can afford the kind of money it takes to get a license, right? Um, or afford a drone on their own. But if anyone still wants to help us anyway, We'll take you and train you to have be an observer and help out a drone team. Do you want to recruit for any other? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you for saying that. Um, so Pascal and I are the co-leads for Bainbridge Prepares Tech Ops. So drones is one program underneath the 
Tech Ops banner. So if you're in, in, interested in Wi-Fi networks, voice over IP, any sort of the geeky cloud, cybersecurity, any of that technology stuff that we talked Solar, about earlier. Solar, battery. Yeah, that stuff too. Um, you can always come come contact us at, at the Tech Ops team on Bainbridge Prepares. We're we're we we love playing with toys. To be honest, we like playing with all the all the tech. We like, you know, like we're pro. Bainbridge Prepares doesn't do blockchain, but if someone said, "Hey, Bainbridge Prepares, what are you guys doing about blockchain?" They would send the question to us, right? I mean, I don't think there's a use case, but anyway, my point is that uh, any sort of stuff that is um, anything other than radio, basically. So there's another team called Bears that does like amateur radio and radio communications and you know push to talk kind of stuff. That's kind of their domain, um, and we work and collaborate with them. But all the other stuff, if if it's bits. You know, if it's ones and zeros, it tends to be us. I don't actually know. Uh, actually, no we, we might we might be deploying a couple satellite stations um, to help just get some uh, some cameras and eyes on certain corners that accidents have happened in the past, so that we can park someone on a or park a tripod, see what's going on, and then be able to have another station review it or have it broadcast back. But um, I haven't finalize those details quite yet. Cool. Well, yeah, I think we're at time here. So, um, so first of all, thank you so much for all your questions and everything. Um, we're going to be hanging out here. If you guys want to come check out the drones, that's fine. And we'll make sure that the uh, slides get posted. Um, I'll make sure that you guys have that up uh, today. I'll, I'll send you a PDF and you can kind of post it. But with that, thank you guys so much. Uh, tell your friends. Uh, <laughs> Tell your enemies, you know, um, you know like, like and, and, and please do give us feedback. You know, if, if, if you think we're completely off base and, and you got concerns, we want to hear those things. Because the only way that this is going to work is being rooted in the community. So, thanks. Thank you. Uh, our next session is the uh, August 13th uh, deep dive into chat GPT. Which is <laughs>